what I'd like to talk about today is, is a question that I think we're all, we're all thinking about, which is, where is this all going? What's the future of design? What are the forces that are shaping design? And what actions should we take to prepare for some of the crazy seismic changes that will totally change our planet? And so, um, you know, what we've seen today and yesterday are a number of examples of great design. Design is a noun, the creation of a beautiful object or an amazing artifact. But design is much more than that as well, as we've heard. Design is a process. It's a way of solving problems. It's a way of looking into the world. It's a way of identifying options and, and imagining, designing, and creating a better world. Now, I believe that there are a number of forces, actually not that many, but three primary forces that are shaping design today. In a global scale. The first is the growth of technology. The second is the impact of society, and specifically industry. And the third is the evolution of human creativity. Now, I'd like to think in pictures, and the one picture I'd like you to think about and perhaps remember at the end of this is there are three very different curves that represent the forces at play. Technology is growing at an exponential rate, and that means that uh, Faster computers are building faster computers and creating an additive, dramatic change. You'll see examples of that. Industry and, of course, society is changing at a chaotic rate. It's rising up and fall. Industries uh, rise and fall very quickly and suddenly and unexpectedly. And human creativity, what? What do you think? Is creativity going up? Is it flat? Is it going down because we're so addicted to our technology? So I'd like to make the case that human creativity is flat. Our raw power to imagine, design, and create is no different than, say, Leonardo's or Virgil or Plato years ago. But something is at play here. So three big uh, stories. So technology, as I mentioned, is evolving at this exponential rate. Here's an interesting statistic. Uh, you might be surprised to hear this. According to the American Microprocessor Association, the number of individual transistors that were produced on the planet is greater than the number of grains of rice harvested on the planet last year at a lower cost. And that's an astonishing statistic. Think about that. And when you think about how many transistors, individual ones, are in your cell phone, you would realize why that's the case. By the way, that uh, statistic actually came out in the year 2006. So it's evolved uh, since then tremendously. And we call this an exponential growth. With every unit of time, the technology, the performance, the data, you know about this, takes a double step. And it suddenly makes this amazing change. We don't notice the change until we notice the change. And uh, one of my very favorite ways to see this is uh, uh, the, through two photographs. This one here, taken in the year 2005, I guess the time we met uh, Ali. And uh, so uh, this is uh, during the. Uh, this is in uh, Rome, and it's the ascension of the Pope. And what I'd like you to do is look in the photograph and see if you can see any smartphones. Okay, anyone? All right. So fast forward to the last descent, 2013, and I want you to see if you can f uh, find any cell phones. <laughs> exactly. Things don't change until they change. And when they change, they change dramatically, don't they? So um, from the point of view of design, it's changing three fundamental things that designers are doing. The first is our ability to read the world, to make sense of it. The second is to understand, analyze, simulate, uh, uh, simulate the world, and then thirdly, to write back to the world. And we've seen examples throughout the entire two days here of each of these kinds of technologies. And each of those are evolving exponentially. So reading, for example, um, is the ability to take, uh, use some kind of device that uh, scans or registers or samples the, the physical world. And there are all kinds of devices. You probably have one in your back pocket or your purse. And uh, these devices come in different shapes and, and forms. Uh, the one that I'd like to show you here looks like, the result of it looks like a movie, but in fact it's a series of individual cell phone photographs which have been digitized and turned into a 3D model. So years ago when I was a computer animator, about 15 years ago, this would have been incredibly expensive and time-consuming to do. This would have cost maybe $70,000, $80,000 for this level of fidelity. Now it's free uh, iPhone app. Understanding the world ref ref uh, reflects how technology now allows us to see and understand tremendously large databases. So for example, using a standard laptop, 
connected to the cloud. It's possible to um, visualize and simulate an entire city complex. This is technology that's here today, and so you can manipulate and understand and actually see into the invisible world as well, what's behind the scenes, understand the system of how things operate together. The computer augments human intelligence, in intelligence and allows us to see in ways that we just have never been able to see before. The third tool of technology is that it allows us to take those digital models and then convert them back to the world. And you may have heard of 3D printing and robotics and advanced additive and subtractive printing, and uh, those are remarkable, and they are uh, allowing us to ma manipulate and print in a wide range of materials, uh, well over 100 uh, different materials. Okay, so that's the first big trend, how design is changing. It, it's, uh, technology is allowing us to augment how we read, understand, and write the world. So this change and also social changes are causing society and industry uh, to rise and fall quite dramatically. And there's a term that the CIA uses, it's called VUCA, and it stands for volatile, uncertain, chaotic, and ambiguous. And that's the state of the world today, and also what they say will be the state of the world furthermore. Why? Because tech, one technology, one way of doing things, one business model will overtake and supersede another way of doing it, causing this amazing, uh, astonishing, crazy chaos. And you're experiencing this here. We experience it in essentially every part of the world, and it's only going to get faster. So industry is rising and falling. It too, uh, as a result of technologies, are going through phases. They go through a digitization phase, a disruption phase, and then a democratization phase. This is very consistent and predictable with just about every industry that information technology is now touching. And you know this, you've seen this. Uh, the way we used to see movies in the past was through physical means, and that was um, transferred over to DVDs, which then went to Netflix, which went, went to online sources, and then other types of sources. The freedom with which people can communicate is a direct correlation with their ability to innovate. So what's the future of this? Some of the emerging technologies that you might find surprising include, say, the way you might make a running shoe in the very near future. Take a number of digital models of it, improve and change the model, manipulate this. I was manipulating this about four years ago in India, by the way, so this is how old this technology is. And using 3D printing, being able to print it out into a completely wearable shoe. Imagine what that will mean. Imagine if you can go into a store and then have your feet scanned and then uh, select the problem that you want the shoe to solve for you and then have that shoe print out in 15 or 20 minutes. It's uh, just around the corner and we're sure to see that. But that's just small objects, right? Okay, so maybe what you're thinking is this, yes, this is it, this is the first 3D printed car. Uh, it's produced in the booming metropolis of my hometown in Canada called Winnipeg, Manitoba. It's the only month we don't have snow, it's a very cold place. And this is the first, uh, it's about 70% of this vehicle has been 3D printed with local tools. So what does that mean? What could that mean if we would be able to 3D print vehicles? What does that mean for the entire supply chain? Great questions to ask. Well, what about other tools? Well, we've, we've seen octocopters. These are portable helicopters. You can put cameras on top of them. And what if you fly one of these things around a building? And um, besides being able to see the building from 360 degrees, it's the number one way to turn a bunch of middle-aged guys into 12-year-old boys. It's insanely fun. And the result of this is, of course, raw data that's then turned into a three-dimensional model, which can be understood, interrogated, analyzed, improved upon, and, um, and, and truly designed and iterated. Next step, indeed you're right. Um, this is a 3D printer. There's a, a number of classes of these 3D printers that build buildings. They lay concrete and other materials. And the interesting thing about these is that complexity comes for free. It doesn't care, the printer doesn't care whether or not you're building a you know, flat building or a beautiful biomimetic structure that makes the, the air cooler in the summer and hotter in the winter because of the wind shape. So just as your laser printer doesn't care, this is the evolution of these kinds of tools. Digitize, disrupt, and then put into the hands of everyone because it becomes, as it becomes more uh, powerful, it becomes cheaper as well. 
So these technologies, these disruptions, are touching just about every industry, from buildings to entertainment to fashion, manufacturing and pharmaceutical. The list is insane. It is going to change everything about how we design the world. Okay, so are you with me? Okay, so we've got technology that is growing exponentially, that's causing industries to rise and fall. And what about human creativity? What about our raw capacity to imagine, design, and create a better world? Well, you know, I like to think, as I mentioned, that we still have the same number of nerve cells and nerve connections as people did 500 and 1,000 and 2,000, maybe even 5,000 years ago. And so we still can only remember seven things, plus or minus two on a good day, and so we still have limited attention. But we, what we still do have, which is innately human, is our ability to imagine something that's new, that hasn't been seen before. Our ability to build something with our hands and learn through the process of building. And then to connect. And by connect, I mean seeing the entire systems of how things fit together, and also to connect emotionally and physically, so that we really understand the meaning of this. That's, I think, you know, part of the essence of human creativity, and at the very essence of design. You know, I like to define design, and we've heard this already, uh, as a way, as a means of identifying the problems that truly matter by systematically exploring alternat alternatives and de delivering solutions that are elegant and wonderful and delightful to the human soul. That's design, uh, in, in my opinion. And uh, the, the whole practice of design is one that is a kind of a human tag team. It's not done by computers, it's done in concert with computers. And the work that I do at uh, Autodesk is very largely built on helping design teams not only change their tool set, but their mindset of the kinds of problems that they're going to have to solve with the newly available tools that are evolving. So, for example, one organization that we've worked with is uh, one called BioLite. And they imagined a, um, a new way of solving a huge problem on the planet, and that is the, uh, to reduce the two million premature deaths that occur because of cooking fires. Cooking fires reduce, produce a, a toxic um, uh, uh, residue that affects people in developing countries. What if you could redesign a cooking fire with a low-cost machine that recycles the toxic fumes, the heat, and then repowers it, um, uh, actually makes the heat, ho um, the fire hotter, uh, reducing the, the, the waste, and also as a bonus, giving you electricity in, in the end. And this is the result here. In North America and in Europe, it's available as a cooking stove, believe it or not. And throughout the developing country, it's, available, it's a tool that actually changes and changes people's lives. You know, the thing that is different that makes technology um, uh, what technology has done with this kind of design process is that it allows you to simulate variations and really understand the mechanics of how this would work. Literally building digital models before the physical one is built. So you understand it much more fully. You make your mistakes quickly and cheaply and the computer helps you along the way. So dramatic changes, as we have seen uh, throughout the, this, this TEDx event, the kinds of, of amazing designs that people are, are bringing to the world. And those largely are built on the power of human creativity and our ability to imagine. Okay, so technology is growing at this uh, exponential rate, allowing us to read, understand, and write to the world. It's causing technology to be, uh, in, in industry to be digitized, disrupted, and democratized. Almost every industry, in fact, every industry that is connected by, uh, with a computer is undergoing this transformation. But human creativity is still at the base of it. Our ability to imagine and build and connect is, will, uh, is at the heart of it. And I believe this stands, these are the places where we truly need to act, where we truly need to cultivate the next generation of design skills. Of course, we need to empathize, of course, we need to prototype, but we also, I think, can capitalize on emerging technologies. Because technologies will continue to grow fully, industry will continue to be more VUCA ever the, the before, and human creativity in its raw form will be flat unless we have brain implants to increase, um, but it will be augmented tremendously by both the advent of technology and by the pressures and opportunities of society and industry. So, what's the future of design? Well, I think it's both bright and chaotic. It's scary, no one really knows. I'd like to show you a few examples of how this we expect to be emerging uh, in the, the short future. 
the way in which people are actually now designing uh, buildings is uh, by creating a digital model, and as the architect is manipulating the model, the computer is working in concert to tell the, the designer um, the properties of the building, the performance of the building, how well it's managing light, heat, crowd flow, the, the, the sound of it. Um, it. It is just astonishing. That information goes to the cloud and the computer quite literally performs thousands, millions, and hundreds of millions of calculations to uh, assist the designer to be able to make the best possible design decisions. That's in real time. That's astonishing uh, a tool to, to help the designer work. So that's the very large scale. What about the small scale? What if you wanted to design a chair, for example? We all know how to design a chair. You build prototypes. But what if a computer could help you design uh, a chair? Well, the work by David Benjamin uh, uh, shows something called computational design, uh, which actually allows the computer to build multiple variations of the chair, tens of them, dozens, hundreds, thousands, millions, and hundreds of millions of, of, of various options. The computer then evaluates each of them under the criteria that are important. As computers become faster and faster and faster, doubling in performance uh, every 18 months, my goodness, it allows you to be able to see the full landscape of of uh, options that the human mind just could not possibly generate. And the result of it is truly astonishing because it allows people to be able to create chairs that, have, that are lighter, stronger, and soon will be able to um, view aesthetics that you can then build and take away. So amazing stuff, this kind of technology. Uh, and just like cell phones, it's not visible until it's visible. It's dramatically changing the way in which people are conceiving. You know, at the very small level, some of the most amazing uh, technologies that we're expecting to see are, are occurring at the nano and even at the microscopic level. It's now possible um, to design uh, micro robots, and these are actually some designs on the left, and then the photo uh, micrographs of those resultant objects on the right. And literally, these things can self-assemble into things like... Um, well, to things that look like this. Um, so this is a, um, a session where we're actually uh, designing DNA. And on the left-hand side is the ADCG uh, areas. And then um, the output on the right represents the robot, the nanorobot that is built uh, on the right. This is two years old, by the way. And the net result of it is a cancer-curing robot. Um, literally, this is micro microscopic. It's just a few nanometers in size. The purple stuff in the middle is the toxin that kills cancer. And then this device only opens up in the presence of a cancer cell. And of course, lots of questions are beginning to evolve. If we have a way to address cancer or other types of uh, ailments with this new kind of technology, should we use it? How do we test? How do we prototype? And these are some of the new questions that design is now grappling with before. A colleague of mine, a friend of mine, Andrew Hessel, has designed a virus. We have a new um, uh, neuro, uh, a synthetic biology division. And so the promise of this is that uh, operating at the smallest self-assembling matter, um, you can produce a self-assembling object. Here it is, magnified 40 million times. But at the smallest level, it truly can self-assemble. The way in which we might make objects in the future, whether it's shoes or this stage or even a building, is perhaps by drawing from nature and actually programming nature. Scary stuff, isn't it? It truly is. But this is the force of uh, design. And the, the power, and I hope I've shown you that design is growing tremendously and exponentially in ways that perhaps you've just never seen before. Design involves identifying the problems that really matter, systematically exploring the alternatives, and del delivering truly elegant solutions. And I believe that it's going to be, a, we're in for a really wide and wild ride of technology. And from the point of view of action, what I would suggest is pay attention to the technology that's emerging, pay attention to the world of VUCA, and identify the opportunities that you have. But most centrally is cultivating, cultivate those most human aspects of human creativity and imagination, because that's where the real action is. And with that, I'd like to say thank you.